Hi, I'm John Blunt. I serve as the Associate Pastor at First Baptist Church of Jacksonville at the Nocatee Campus. Thank you so much for watching our sermon today. Our mission at First Baptist is to reach all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life. If you'd like to join us for church in person, we're located just south of Jacksonville in the Nocatee community. We hope you participate with us however you're watching today's service as we worship Jesus, pray, and read His Word together. If you have questions about today's message or just want to connect with us, you can find out more about our church at fbcjacks.com slash Nocatee or on Facebook at First Baptist Church Jacksonville Nocatee Campus. Thanks for joining us. You can open up your Bibles to the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms chapter 42. That's where we're going to be tonight. Book of Psalms chapter 42. I am pleased to say, I don't, I don't know if I should say it, but I'm pleased to say it doesn't look like it's going to rain when I start preaching here in just a second, but we'll see. Psalm 42, we're in the middle of a series uh, called The Fight of Faith, God's Promises for Life's Problems. So what we're doing is we are taking a common problem that we experience in life, and then we're taking a promise from a passage of God's Word or a truth from God's Word, and we're trying to say, how can this truth from God's Word meet this promise and touch down in our daily life? So when, but we've said several times that when you, the goal is that when you leave this place, you're able to take the truth of Scripture and apply it to your life in the problems as they're happening. And so that's our goal in this series, and that's what we're doing here in Psalm 42. Let's uh, read the entire chapter together. Psalm 42, for the choir director, a mascal of the sons of Korah, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with the voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. O my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and all your waves have rolled over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And his song will be with me in the night. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As a shattering of my bones, my adversaries revile me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him. The help of my countenance and my God. Let's pray one more time. Lord, Illuminate your word. Help us to understand what it is saying. Help us to take the truth of this passage and apply it to the problems of our life. We do pray that you would lift up your son, Jesus Christ. He is the yes and amen of all of your promises. So I pray, Lord, that you would lift him up and draw people to yourself in these moments that we have together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I will never be better. This is what he says to his friend as they sit in his room. It's been about five months now uh, since the sadness and the depression started. He wakes up, he gets out of bed, and his feet hit the floor, and he gets overcome by sadness, and in many mornings he just crawls back in bed, hoping that he can fall asleep 
again because he doesn't want to face the day. He's lost weight. He's skinnier now uh, because he doesn't have an appetite anymore because he's just overcome with sadness and despair. He cries without knowing why. He'll lay on the floor in his bedroom and just cry without knowing why. He doesn't understand what's happening to him. He doesn't understand where this is coming from. Why is he so sad? He, he prays to God and he's asking God, would you please help me with my doubts? But that just reminds him that he wonders if God's forgotten him. It reminds him of the doubts that he has. He's wondering if God's even there at all. And it gets worse. He's been reading skeptics of his faith. Uh, people who are actively seeking to dismantle his faith, saying, where's God? I don't, there's no God. They're trying to dismantle uh, his faith in the existence of God, his faith in the resurrection of Jesus, his faith in the authority of the Bible and the reliability of the Bible. So everything is feeling shaky in his life. And he feels a little crazy. He's not suicidal, but he has wished that God would just let him die because he's just overcome with the dread that he feels. But he keeps praying. He keeps going to church. He keeps reading the Bible, but he just feels like he's hanging on. That's it. I'm just, just, just hanging on. It's everything just to get him to church. It's everything just to get him to read. And he wonders, he wonders, is there anybody that can help? Is there anybody who actually understands just how dark it is for me? Just how sad and depressed and despairing he actually is. He wonders, does the Bible have anything to say about everything that I'm feeling right now? The person I'm talking about in that story is me, about 10 years ago. It's my story. You could call it depression. You can call it discouragement. You can call it despair. Uh, or you could simply just call it sadness. I was overcome with deep sadness about 10 years ago for, for almost an entire year of my life. I say I was overcome because that's exactly what it felt like. It felt like being steamrolled by something, something just overcoming you and taking over your thoughts and your feelings, feeling like you're in a pit and you really actually can't get out of it. You don't know how to get out of it. So what do you do? What do you say to somebody like that? Maybe you've experienced that in your life. Maybe you've experienced that same type of just debilitating sadness depression, despair, or whatever you want to call it, this, this dark fog that can come over your life and you're just, I don't know how to get out of this. I don't know what to do or what to say. Maybe it came or has come as a result of some suffering that you're experiencing in your life that just won't go away. Maybe there's some grief that's entered into your life. Something's been taken from you that's really precious and everything's gotten dark since then. Or maybe it feels really unexplainable. You said, you know what, there's no sin in my life. There's, there's really no suffering in my life, but I am just overcome with this sadness and this depression in my life, and I don't know what to do. Maybe that's you right now. Maybe it's been you. Maybe it's going to be you. Maybe you know somebody that's going through this right now, and you look at them and you say, I have no idea how to help. So what do you do? What do you do when you're overcome with sadness? And sadness is a really common struggle in the fight of faith. It's a common struggle that a lot of Christians deal with, but it's a struggle that we all have a very hard time talking about. It's something that Christians particularly, I think, have a hard time talking about being discouraged, having a hard time feeling, I feel depressed, I feel like I'm despairing, I feel like I don't have any hope, because we don't like looking weak. We don't like asking for help. We don't like the idea of going up to a pastor or a friend in your life group or your Sunday school class and say, I don't know what to do, but I just feel so sad. I don't know what to say. We don't like not looking like we have it together. If we're just honest, we all like coming into this room and everyone thinks they're fine. 
On top of that, we wonder as Christians, am I allowed to be sad? Sometimes you walk around in a church service on a Sunday morning and it's like everybody either is happy or really good at pretending to be happy. And so I don't feel like what's going on inside of me fits here right now. Am I allowed to be sad? How do I respond to my sadness? Is this unbelief? How do I deal with sadness? Psalm 42 was written for people with questions like that. It's written for us. The psalm is written by the sons of Korah. You see that in the little subscript below the psalm in Psalm 42. And it contains some of the most honest words in the Bible about sadness, about depression, about despair, whatever you would call it. It provides some of the most honest, raw words we could find about this emotion that so many of us experience or will experience in our life. And I want us to notice in this passage, the author of this psalm provides us just two responses to sadness. Two responses to sadness that will help us in the fight of faith. That will help us in the fight of faith in this area of our life. So if you are discouraged, if you feel like you're in a pit of depression, if you feel like you are sad and you don't know how to not be sad, this is for you. Two responses that this passage gives us to sadness so we can engage in the fight of faith. Let's look at these two responses together. Here's the first response. Number one, talk about your sadness honestly with God. That's a lot to say, but every word's important. Talk about your sadness honestly with God. God. The first thing you're going to notice about this psalm, like so many psalms, is it's a prayer. The psalmist is talking to God about the sadness that he's experiencing in his life. And the way that he talks to God is really instructive for the way we should think about this experience of despair and discouragement and sadness in our life. I want you to notice, just we're going to walk through the entire chapter real quick. We're not going to hit every verse tonight, but let's just walk through this. And I want you to notice two characteristics of the way he talks to God, he prays to God about his sadness. First, I want you to notice how honest he is. Notice how honest he is. Let's just look at some verses. Look at verse 3. My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? He's saying, I'm crying all the time. It's like food for me to eat. I'm crying all the time. And on top of that, there's enemies of my faith that are attacking the things that make me feel stable when things are unstable. Verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with the voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. He's saying, I remember the times that I had joy. I remember them. Those were good times. I'm able to recollect times in my mind when God was near and I was near to God. But those times aren't now. Past tense. I remember that. I remember those times of joy. They're in the past. They're not in the present. Verse 6. First part of verse 6. Oh my God, my soul is in despair within me. So he's saying, my soul is bowed really low. It's in the dirt. Despair means you no longer believe that there is hope in the future. It means that the hope looks dark and you don't know how it's not going to be dark. You're losing hope. This is next level sadness. This is despair. It's when you've given up hope. It's more than being bummed out on like a lazy Saturday afternoon about something that didn't go right that day. This is next level sadness. Look at verse seven. So look at this honesty. Deep calls to deep. At the sound of your waterfalls, all your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. He says, it's like I'm underwater 
and waves are just crashing down on me, and I cannot get to the top. Have you ever been out in the ocean and tried to do body surfing? I tried to do that recently. It was fun, and it was also a little scary. You get caught under the water, and another wave comes, and another wave comes, and another wave comes, and you're like, oh my goodness, there's four feet of water out here, and I'm going to drown. Am I going to make it out of this? That's his experience. Verse 9, I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? So he asks God, why have you forgotten me? Where are you? It's not just that his enemies are saying God isn't near. He's saying it, it feels like you've left me. It's gotten into his soul. Okay, so, so that is brutal honesty, isn't it? About the sadness that he's experiencing. He is not sugarcoating the struggle. This is raw, naked truth about what is going, let me open up my heart and you can look at the raw truth of how I'm doing right now. So it's honest the way he's talking to God about his sadness. But here's a second characteristic. It's honest and it's also God-centered. Okay? It's God-centered the way he talks about it. Let's just walk through those verses again. Verse 3. Just notice how it's all to God. My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all day long, where is your God? So the crux of the issue for this person is the absence of God, meaning his joy and his happiness is tied to the presence of God in his life. That's where his joy comes from. Verse four, these things I remember as I pour out my soul within me, I used to go along with the throng, lead them in procession to the where? House of God with the voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. The joyful times in his life are connected to the presence of God. Do you see that? It's when he's in God's presence that he has joy. Verse 6, it's all directed at God. Oh my God, my soul is in despair within me. I'm experiencing the depths of sadness and I'm talking about my sadness to you, God. I'm telling you about my despair. Verse 7, deep, look at this. So all the waves of sadness are coming over him. Did you notice what he said about them, these waves? Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your God breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The suffering and sadness are a result of the waves that are God's. They're your breakers. They're your waves. And he says, this is why I'm talking to you about this, God. You're in control of my life. You could change my circumstances. Verse 9, I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? He's talking to God about his absence. It's so striking. Did you notice in verse 9? He says, I say to God, my rock. So I know you're my comfort and you're my rock, but where in the world are you? (laughs) It's this experience of I know who you are, but you are not near. You're supposed to be my rock. God's my rock but it feels like God's forgotten me. He talks to God about his sadness with honesty, and he talks to God about his sadness in a God-centered way. God has everything to do with what he is feeling. And, And the reason I want us to see that, the reason why I'm going through this passage two times in a row to see the honesty and to see the god centeredness of it is because our culture typically disconnects our rawest and darkest emotions from God. God has nothing to say about that. 
God doesn't talk about depression in the Bible. God doesn't talk about despair in the Bible. God doesn't talk about, there's no, there's no categories that God has for these deep emotions. God doesn't have anything to say about that. So you know what? God can talk about these things over here, but these really scary issues that go on in people's hearts, the Bible doesn't have anything to say about that stuff. So we need to go to other places. We need to talk to other people about these problems. But that's not what the psalmist does, is he? He assumes that God has categories for sadness, despair, what we would call in our culture today depression, so much so that he pours out his heart to God in a prayer. How would you feel if someone started talking like this in your Sunday school class or your life group? What if we got back to Sunday school September 13th, woohoo, Sunday school on September 13th. We're excited about that. We all get back in our rooms and prayer request time comes and um, someone raises their hand and said, yeah, I, I really need you guys um, to pray for me. I am just despairing. Um, it seems like God has completely forgotten me. Um, my soul is so disturbed. I don't know where God is. He feels far. I remember back when things were good, but it's not good now, and I am just in the middle of darkness in my life. I can imagine that we'd feel uncomfortable with that. I'd imagine that we would feel uncomfortable, but this is in the Bible. This is in the Bible. God inspired this chapter of the Bible. It is biblical to talk about the struggles that you're having in your life. Did you know that? It's biblical to talk about the ways you're sad. It's biblical to talk about the ways you despair. God has written psalms like this to give you words to articulate some of the darkest feelings you can have in your soul. The psalms were meant to be sung in the congregation. Can you imagine singing this? With that? Andrew gets up here and sings, Why have you forgotten me, God? It's meant to be a public articulation of hard things that happen in our hearts. But the most important reason that God wrote these psalms for us is so that we would talk to him honestly about it. That's the point. God wants you to use the words of Scripture to talk to him about some of the darkest emotions that you feel. He wants you to talk to him honestly when you feel overwhelmed. Listen, God can handle your emotions. Did you know that? God can handle your emotions that you feel, that you felt today, that you would be ashamed to talk about. God can handle it when you talk to him, when you pray. And he gave us psalms like this to show us that. So God wants us to talk to him honestly about our sadness, but he doesn't just want us to talk to him. What's really striking about this psalm is that he also wants us to talk to our sadness. So we see that in the second response to sadness. Number two, we are to talk to sadness with God. Talk to sadness in your heart, in your soul, with God. My, my daughters will often do something really strange. I don't know if you, for those of you who interact with kids, you have things like this that happen. Uh, so we'll be in the room of one of, our, one, one of our rooms in our house, or we'll be outside, we'll be like playing in the sprinkler, or playing, we have a swing in our backyard, we'll swing out there, we'll be laughing as a family in our living room, and uh, just having a really fun time with, with like all the kids and the family will be there together, and then one daughter or will walk in, and they'll just have a frown on their face, like this, and they walk down, they plop down, they have a frown, and it's really funny to us because it's like, why are you sad? We're all having a great time in here. No one's done anything to you. Everything's fine. And so what my wife and I will do is we'll look, we'll look at one of our daughters, daughters and we'll say, what's your deal? That, that, that's what we'll say, really caring. <laughs> but here's the reason we do that. We do that because we know that the, the sadness they're experiencing is probably real. 
We're not doubting the fact that they may feel sad in that moment. And if there's something really going on, we want to understand it. We want to understand that emotion that they're feeling. But we also know that their emotion isn't matching what's true in that moment. Does it make sense? We know there's a lot going on in our house that's joyful, and you come into our, our room, and you're frowning, and you're plopping down, and you're huffing, and you're puffing, and what's going on? What we want for our daughter is we want her to experience the truth of the situation that we're in. Saying, you are sad, but we need to inform you of what's going on in here. Let us tell you all the reasons that this is a good place to be. This is a good spot to be in. This, this, your, your emotions, they are real, but they're not aligning with the truth. We want, honestly, for our daughter to get a little bit skeptical of her sadness. And that's what the psalmist does with his sadness here. He starts to interrogate it. Did you notice this? He talks to himself. Look at verse 5. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? And then you look down at verse 11, same thing. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? The psalmist starts talking back to his soul. He says, what's the deal? What's going on with you, soul? Why are you so sad? Why are you so disturbed? Why does he do this in response to this deep sadness that he feels? We just see how, how honest he is. He's being raw. This is how I feel. This is a real experience. We can be honest about these real experiences, but then he talks to himself and says, why are you feeling that way? The reason he does that is because he knows this sadness isn't aligned with reality. That's what he's saying. This isn't aligned with reality. My emotions are real. I'm not going to lie about the way that I feel in this psalm. It's real. It feels like God's forgotten me. It feels like I'm drowning. I'm despairing. But why am I feeling that way? So I'm honest, but I'm honestly suspicious. He's skeptical about whether or not his emotions are assessing his situation correctly. And so, he keeps talking to himself. He keeps talking to his sadness. Look at the second half of verse 5. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. Verse 11, hope in in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. He asks his despairing soul questions. Why are you sad? Why are you despairing? Why are you downcast? And then he speaks the truth to his soul. Hope in God, soul. The antidote to despair is hope in God. That's the truth of the passage. The, the antidote to despair is hope in God. So here's the question, though. What does it mean to hope in God? Because if I just say to you, you just, listen, you're feeling real sad, you're feeling real depressed, you just need to hope in God. That kind of feels like a Bible Band-Aid. You, you, we need to define this. What, what are we talking about when we're talking about hoping in God? Because if this is really the answer, then, then what are we talking about? Let me give you a definition. Hoping in God means interpreting your future through the filter of God's character and promises revealed in Christ and his word. Let me say that one more time. Hoping in God means interpreting your future, what's coming, what's ahead, through the filter of God's character and God's promises as they are revealed in Christ and in Scripture, rather than your emotions. So you see that in the text. He says, hope in God so there's the truth, hope in God, and then he immediately says something about his future. Did you notice that? So hope in God, I shall. 
So this is a future statement. I will, again, praise him for the help of his presence. He's saying, I know that God will help me. He will be present with me. He has not left me. And he says that in the middle of feeling like God has. Do you see the tension there? So what he's saying is, this is how I feel. I feel alone. I feel like God has left me. I feel like the darkness and waves are just overwhelming me. But I will not look at my future through the filter of what I feel. I'll look at my future through what God has revealed. Hope in God. And that's how I will interpret my future. He's reciting to his soul, not what he feels, but who God is as he's revealed in Scripture. What do we say to ourselves when the sad thoughts come? If you're like me, what typically I I can do is I just repeat them to myself. I just I just say them over and over again to myself about these things that I think are just gonna be dark forever. And what he says is, no, 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 soul. Hope in God. You will praise him again. There's an old Welsh preacher named Martin Lloyd-Jones. He preached in England back in the mid-20th century, and he preached through this passage in a book that's called Spiritual Depression, Its Causes and Its Cure. I recommend it to you. Listen to what he said about this passage. This is a quote. Have you ever realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Take those thoughts that come to you the moment you wake up in the morning. You have not originated them, but they are talking to you. They bring back the problems of yesterday, etc. Somebody is talking. Who is talking? Yourself is talking to you. Now, this man's treatment in Psalm 42 was this. Instead of allowing this self to talk to him, he starts talking to himself. Why are you cast down, O my soul? He asks. His soul had been depressing him, crushing him. So he stands up and says, self, listen for a moment. I will speak to you. One of the most important lessons that I learned during the deep season of discouragement and depression and sadness that I felt for a whole year of my life, one of the most important lessons I learned was this. My feelings are real, but they aren't always true. My feelings are real. They're real. It's silly. This is, this is why people sometimes feel like church isn't a, a safe place for them, is because we can sometimes deny that feelings are real. No, 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 they're real. They're just not always true. Actually, regularly, they aren't true. My feelings go awry if I have like bad hot wings for dinner. I mean, we're so fickle. Like, our feelings can be very unreliable. Here's what this means. It means that my feelings are not an objective interpreter of what is true about God, about what is true about myself, or my future, or my situation. My feelings often tell me things that are just simply not true. They're just not true. They're not true biblically. They're even just not true in general. You ever ever think that someone's thinking something about you really terrible and then you realize they're not thinking anything about me? Actually, what they're thinking about is not me. They're thinking about themselves. But you're like convinced. They hate me. My life's over. Some of us convince ourselves like, I'm going to get fired or I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to do that. Our feelings are very unreliable. So what happened to me through that season is I just developed a very healthy skepticism of my own emotions. They're there. I recognize them. They're wrong a lot. So I have to evaluate what I feel according to God's word. If my emotions aren't lining up with the reality of God's word, I gotta talk to those things. This is how this is how it's possible to be righteously sad, right? So this is how you can be sad and be righteous while doing it. So you you just you say, God. What I feel right now, I feel overwhelmed. I feel so overwhelmed. I feel overwhelmed by sorrow for this or that reason or maybe no reason at all. I just feel really sad. But what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to believe that my future is not determined or governed by what I feel right now. It's not true. Instead, what I'm going to believe, Lord, is that I will again praise you. I can just, I can just tell you, just personal testimony of just, just weeping and not knowing why, but just saying like, God, I'm just trusting that I'm going to praise you again. I can remember standing in my church, couldn't even sing, couldn't get the words out because I didn't know if I believed them. But I was just like, Lord, I'm here because you feel so far. But I'm just trusting that I'm going to praise you again. And that leads to the renewing thought. So I give you one renewing thought every week that you can take on the road, okay? From Psalm 42, 5. And it's this, in sadness, hope in God. That's it. So when I'm sad, when I feel the dark cloud come over my head, hope in God. Hope in God. So let me just give you three ways to apply this to the nitty gritty this week. Number one, be biblically honest about sadness in your life. Be honest about it. If God inspired a passage like this to be sung in the church and to inform our prayers, then we should use it and be honest about the ways that we're struggling with sadness. We should just be honest with one another about this. Feeling sad, feeling despair, feeling depression. If you're struggling in this way, bring it to God. Talk to him. Open up Psalm 42 and pray it to God. Pray scripture to God. But I also want to encourage us in our context at this campus we should be bringing this to other brothers and sisters in the Lord. We really should. We should be talking to each other about this. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So let's bear each other's burdens in this area of our life. One of the ways that people experiencing this type of sadness can really experience comfort and even experience God's nearness is to have brothers and sisters that come alongside them and they say, I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you go. The Lord is with you. The Lord is near you. He promises he's not going to leave you. Jesus died for you. You trust him. I'm going to be with you, and the Lord is with you. And oftentimes that's the thing that just takes that person who's in the pit and helps them hang on. The Lord wants to use you in the life of a person that's sad or despairing or depressed. But we need to talk about these things. We need to share testimonies of these things like I'm sharing with you. You need to pull other Christians aside and say, let me tell you about how hard it was. Bear each other's burdens. Number two, recognize sadness, but don't believe it. Recognize sadness, but don't believe it. The psalmist questions his sad soul. He's honest about his sadness, but he doesn't believe everything that he feels. So I'm encouraging us to do the same. We aren't an accurate assessor of our life when we assess it through the filter of our own emotions. So let's just burst the bubble and let's all admit I don't do a good job at objectively assessing my life. I just don't do a very good job at that. Especially when I'm interpreting everything through my emotions. Interpret everything through scripture in your life. Everything I feel, everything I think, everything I say, compare it to scripture. If it doesn't line up with scripture, reject it. It's not true. And listen, that, you probably hear me say that, reject what you feel, and you might feel a little prickly about that because that's so countercultural. We are immersed in a culture that says the most true thing about you is what you're feeling. That's what our culture says. If you feel it, nobody can question it. That's what our culture says. If you feel something deeply, that is your identity. That's why we struggle when somebody gets up here with the Bible and says, question what you feel. What you feel isn't true. Sometimes we can be like, How did, why is he talking that way about my emotions? It's because the world has shaped our thinking and we need to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. God gives us permission to question what we think and what we feel. It could be wrong. God does not identify you by your feelings. He identifies you in relation to himself. You're created in his image. He's your creator. He is your God. That's where we get our value and that's where we get our identity from him, not from ourselves. Number three, 
Last one, preach the gospel to yourself. Depression is often this sense of doom that everything in the future looks really, really dark and it feels impossible to go forward. So how do you speak to that? You speak to it like the psalmist did. You say to your soul, hope in God, hope in God, hope in God. And the way you do that now, brothers and sisters, is what you do is you say, my hope has a name, Jesus Christ. My hope is a person. My hope is a person, is Jesus Christ. Our hope is a person. Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our future. Jesus is everything. Jesus is our hope. First Peter chapter one. How do we know that everything is going to be okay? Like really okay for real. And it's not just like something on a Hallmark card. How do I know that everything's really gonna be okay in my life? We know that because Jesus is our hope. We've been born again through faith in him to a living hope. Our future contains an inheritance that won't fade away. It's protected and it's undefiled. We can rejoice because Jesus Christ died in our place on the cross. He rose from the dead to give us real hope. If you trust in him, if you put your faith in him and not yourself, you will have a hope that's protected that nothing can touch even your darkest emotions. And so we can tell our hearts, God's near. He's not going to leave me. I'm hidden in Christ and God forever is near to me because of that truth. So preach that to yourself when you get up in the morning. Jesus died for me. He's made me new. He's alive right now. I have a future in heaven. I have an inheritance that won't fade away. It's protected for me. The future feels dark, but it's not dark. It's bright in Christ. So why are we despairing? Why are we so disturbed? Hope in God. Hope in God. We will again praise him for the hope of his presence. We hope you enjoyed today's sermon. If you have questions about the message, reach out to us at askapastor at fbcjacks.com. We meet for services every Sunday morning and Wednesday evening. For more info, go to fbcjacks.com slash Thank you for watching, and we're praying for you as you go reaching all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life.